Yahweh has placed good leadership in position for our protection. Hi, this is Barry Phelps. The 10 minute Torah, day four of the Torah portion, Shemot, meaning names. We are in Exodus or Shemot chapter two still, and let's go down to verse 16. And the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water, and they filled the troughs to water their father's flock. The shepherds came and drove them away. Then Moshe stood up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. So this is a real-life story. There were seven daughters of Yitro, the priest of Midian. Let's remember that Midian is the fourth son of Avraham and Keturah, so he is a relative. But they, having been circumcised, being sons of Avraham, were merely blessed and sent away. So their circumcision, their identity to the covenant, has really not benefited them as much as Yitzhak. Therefore, Midian may have indeed held a grudge and thought my circumcision means nothing. This God of Abraham doesn't favor us. So imagine their angst, if you will. So enter the picture Moshe. He is a fugitive. He looks like a Mitzrite. He looks Egyptian to them. He sounds and speaks as a Mitzrite, an Egyptian. He's obviously not a Midianite. And this man shows up just when it's very important to do so. Now, seven daughters of Yitro, seven daughters. We say that again, seven daughters. The number seven is significant for us many times in Scripture especially when we consider the idea of the seven assemblies that are found in the book of the Revelation of Yeshua. Women are often found for us at wells. That's where uh, Rachel, not Rachel, Rivka, excuse me, the wife of Yitzhak or Isaac was found. It's uh, rabbinically stated that that's where Avram first found Sarai, Abraham and Sarah. It's uh, where Yeshua found the woman at the well. It's where Yaakov found Rachel at the well. So the bride, the symbolic role of the bride, she is often found at the well. And indeed, as we're to learn, one of these seven daughters, Zipporah, becomes the bride of Moshe. So seven daughters, seven assemblies, we will liken them to, to the book of Revelation. They are looking for water. That is the revelation of the Messiah, the living water of the Messiah. Yeshua said to the woman at the well in Yochanan, John chapter 4, if you knew he was speaking to you, you would have asked of him to give you living water, and you would never have to come back to this well uh, to draw water again, or that's at least what she interpreted. I don't want to come back here for physical water. He was speaking of spiritual water. So, What's going on with these seven daughters? Well, they are being abused and they are being prohibited water from the well for their flocks by abusive shepherds. Imagine the abusive shepherds, Jeremiah 23, Ezekiel 34, we read about Yah's idea concerning abusive shepherds and how ruthlessly He will deal with them. And so these false shepherds are turning away those of the seven assemblies, prohibiting them to come and get the water that they want. Rather, they perhaps will portion it out. Maybe they will draw what they think that they are deserving of until someone who is stronger, a Mashiach, a Messiah type, like Moshe shows up, and he is the deliverer. So he overcomes the ways of the false shepherds, and he waters the flock of the assemblies. So there is a parallel here that in the last days, it is the waters that Moshe draws and pours for us, that is the Torah, the living waters that will be given to the congregations of Yah so that they are able to get away from the false teachings of false shepherds. 
Now, again, notice that the daughters did not recognize Moshe as a Hebrew, but rather they thought him Egyptian or Mitzrite. There are many who do not recognize the Hebrew identity of Yeshua, but he will nonetheless draw the waters of the Torah for them so that they may live and so that their flocks may grow. And then he takes of them a bride for himself. Beautiful pictures here. Amazing uh, details that are given for us that are real-life scenarios, real-life consequences and facts, but they speak to us about who we are right here, right now. Now, concerning leadership, what if Moshe didn't show up? What if Moshe did show up and said, it's not my problem? What if he said, I'm just going to see how this turns out? Let them get their own water. What if Moshe had joined the abusive shepherds and played along? None of those things actually took place because he involved himself. He took accountability. He took responsibility. He stepped in where no one else would step in, and he made sure that things were resolved correctly and with justice. Heard it many times stated to me how that there are local assemblies and congregations, uh, and again, I've heard it many times, where no one wants anyone in charge. We just want to come together, read the word together, and see what happens. This fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants style of uh, congregational effort, it may work. It has an ability to work in some settings. But who's accountable? What if someone espouses something in the study of the text that is doctrinally incorrect? Do we sit back and say nothing? Do we simply say, well, that's your opinion and I disagree? What if they continually began to espouse things that are in error concerning Scripture? Maybe they want to promote polygamy. Uh, multiple marriage partners. Maybe they want to denigrate those who live in the land and say they're not Jews. They're somebody else. What if it's anti-Semitism? Uh, what if it's, um, I don't know, some, the list can go on of, of crazy doctrines. Do we say nothing? Do we just go along? Do we agree with them to get along? Somebody has to be in charge. If there is someone that is abusive in your group that meets and they shout down those who disagree with them or they run uh, in a very intimidating personality in front of everyone and dare to be disagreed with, what if they make unreasonable relational demands of others? Is there not someone that would stand and say, this is not This is not allowed. This is prohibited. You're not going to do this. You're out of bounds with Scripture. We need good leadership. And good leadership doesn't mean that it's the person without the ability to fail. They're going to be as human as anybody else in the room. Good leadership says, I will take responsibility for what happens in the midst of us, not only when we gather But when you're hurting, when you're in need, when you need someone to talk to, my spouse and I will be available and we'll sit down and we'll talk with you. We'll pray with you and see if we can come to an answer. And if we don't have an answer, we're to simply say, I don't know what to tell you to do. That's being a good leader. No congregation is going to grow. No home group is going to significantly grow. You're not going to reach anyone much beyond yourselves in your community without someone casting some sort of vision and understanding of what it is that Yah is asking of you. The seven assemblies were spoken to, and they were admonished and encouraged for the good, but they were also corrected for the errors that were in the midst of them. Someone has to be that available spokesperson for the heart and the character of Yeshua to stand up in the congregation and say, this is not right, but this is right. Agree or disagree, we can learn to be under good leadership. Pray that the Father raise up good shepherds. That's what he said he would do in Ezekiel 34. And be part of his answer. 
We'll see you again tomorrow. And to the end, Shalom. Shalom.